Cooney Lake is located in the Kavalik region of Nunavut, Canada. It is one of several lakes located along the Kazan River. Specifically, the lake is found in a central part of the country, almost 1,500 miles northwest of the capital Ottawa. The lake sits at approximately 256 meters above sea level and is spread across 191 square miles. This is a very rural area and the lake today is almost unpopulated with less than two inhabitants per square mile. For thousands of years, the area attracted both the Caribou Inuit peoples and the Chipewyan Seisidin. This was mostly due to the abundance of wildlife found in this harsh wilderness. Originally, however, the Inuit people did not initially settle in the area, but would return to the coast for the winter. It's worth stressing that the average annual temperature hovers at around minus 10 degrees Celsius and drops to minus 25 degrees Celsius at its coldest. That is 14 and minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit respectively. During the 18th century, the Dean peoples began to abandon the area for reasons that I'm not aware of while various Inuit bands began to live year-round among the lakes and river. In today's times though, the Inuits don't live there, but they do travel there for hunting and fishing purposes. It's easy and normally the case for some to think of the Inuit peoples as solely living in the vast wilderness of Canada's Arctic, but they are actually part of a much larger family that extends from the Bering Sea through Alaska and northern Canada all the way to Greenland. The Inuit people tell of many legends, such as the Kiviuk, who is described as a legendary hero, an eternal Inuit wanderer who brought about the abundance of fish and the lack of trees in the Arctic tundra. Another famous myth is that of the sea goddess Sedna, who was a young girl cast into the ocean where she became the keeper of all sea mammals. Though not all of these figures are benevolent in nature. The Inuit people speak of the Kualupalik, scaly, human-like creatures that dwell deep within the waters who rise to the surface and take unsuspecting travellers. Another legend is that of the Takriaksut, a people that hide in the shadows and are rarely seen, but are often heard in the darkness. The Ijarat are said to be shapeshifters that take the form of arctic animals but have trouble disguising their red eyes. And perhaps the most menacing of all is the Mahaha, a demon as described by the Inuit people that travels across the Arctic, waiting for the perfect moment to take their unsuspecting victims before tickling them until they eventually pass away. While completely bizarre and baffling, it does make one think of how these legends came to fruition. Were they simply tales to keep their children in line, or did the ancient Inuit people genuinely believe that these things were happening? Whatever the case may be, there is no doubt that they hold an interesting history. This tale begins in November of 1930, far up in the heart of one of the loneliest places on Earth, Lake Anjikuni, Canada. The location is 500 miles northwest of the port of Churchill on Hudson Bay, where a whole tribe of Eskimos disappeared under very unusual circumstances. The tribe was 25 man, woman and child strong, yet somehow the desolate tundra managed to swallow them whole in their entirety. According to Emmett E. Keller, a special correspondence for various newspapers, including the Syracuse Herald back in the 1930s, described this incident as such. It is one of the most puzzling mysteries that has ever come down out of the Arctic. The news of it has just reached the pass on the fringe of civilization. This discovery was found when a roving trapper of the barren lands, Joe LaBelle, came upon the abandoned camp while seeking shelter. Joe knew this tribe well, and they were very friendly to him, allowing him to stay on a number of previous occasions. On this day, the air was filled with a biting cold, and the weather had worsened throughout this particular week, and Joe said that he was excited to reach the village to hunker down next to a warm fire. 
As said, this was a 25 person strong settlement and generally speaking was a very active place with warm hearted souls going about the business. The village was full of hewn huts and tents and upon arrival, Joe made his presence known, but silence and the wind howls were the only things to greet him back. During later questioning, Joe would admit that upon entering the village something felt wrong, but he couldn't quite place his finger on it other than an instinctual gut feeling that this was not a good place to be. Joe said, stumbling on the abandoned village gave me the creeps. A man doesn't get the creeps readily when spending months at a time trudging alone across the barren lands where there is never a house or a human being or anything to break the white rim silence, but this was creepy. Joe didn't like this, but felt the need to investigate further, so he left his canoe beached on the edge of the lake, no more than 100 yards from the village. His greeting went unanswered, but as he approached the village, two half-starved huskies descended from a nearby tent. At first, Joe was concerned, but came to realise that the dogs weren't barking, but instead were whining dolefully, as he would later describe. He then counted that seven dogs had passed away and were scattered around the huts and tents. This is what he said upon entering the village. There were six tents made out of skin. I'll admit that when I went in the first tent, I was a little jumpy. Just looking around, I could see the place hadn't known any human life for months and I expected to find corpses inside, but there was nothing there but the personal belongings of a family. A couple of deer parkers were in one corner. Fish and deer bones were scattered about. There were a few pairs of boots and an iron pot, greasy and black. Under one of the parkers, I found a rifle. It had been there so long, it was all rusty. The whole thing looked as if it had just been left that way by people who expected to come back, but they hadn't come back. I went outside and looked over the rest of the camp. I can tell you, I was puzzled. I figured there had been about 25 people in the camp, but all signs showed that the place hadn't been lived in for some time. I found the other tents in a similar state. I tried to figure out where those Eskimos had gone to. They hadn't moved to a new territory, or they would have taken their equipment, especially their defense items and their dogs. Then I thought of the Eskimo's evil spirit, Tongasuk, who has an ugly man's face with two long tusks sticking up from each side of the nose. For those that don't know, and I didn't either, in Inuit legend, the Tongasuk was a powerful god that was said to have arrived from the sky. It is said to be a mischievous demon or spirit worshipped by way of offerings in Greenland and the northeastern regions of Canada. Furthermore, the Tongasuk is the master of whales and seals and is considered the most powerful being in Greenland. He appears in the form of a bear or a one-armed man. He is considered to be invisible to everyone but the shamans among the Eskimo peoples. Specifically, the demon's presence is said to be invoked by fishermen. Again, it's not clear if the Inuit peoples genuinely believed that these beings were real or if they created these legends for an ulterior purpose. But for Joe LaBelle, that was the first thing that came to his mind and one can only assume that he came to know of the Inuit mythology with the pride time spent with them across numerous occasions. Joe continued and said that the native people there always wore charms to ward off the Tonga Cirque, presumably because they believed that the fishermen drew him close. As Joe was wandering around the abandoned village, he said that he had a hard time getting bad thoughts about the legend out of his mind. He said that the other tents offered similar findings as those prior, abandoned food, skins, defensive items, and all of which he had a hard time understanding why they would have been left behind. He said that in his experience, he didn't believe that these people would have voluntarily wandered away without a means of defense. At this point, it seems that Joe tried to reason as to what could have happened here and at first thought about the idea that if somehow the entire group of people had succumbed to the waters, or if this was an intentional act. However, he then found something that confused him further. Upon closer inspection, he noticed that an Eskimo grave had been desecrated, but he couldn't tell when it had been opened or where the contents had gone. He said despite being creeped out to no end, he stayed there for a large part of the afternoon trying to piece the puzzle together. Now while things are already strange, let's get bizarre. Joe said that what had confused him the most was that there didn't seem to be any signs of a struggle taking place. He said that he fully expected to find some evidence of a third party on the scene, but everything seemed peaceful, albeit with an air of abnormality. 
Joe had planned on staying the night there, but at this point had seen enough not to want to, so he fed the dogs and instead began making his way to civilization to inform the authorities. According to all articles, officers of the Northwest Mounted Police made their way to the village to investigate. However, they too couldn't solve the puzzle, only coming up with the theory that perhaps while hunting, a particularly devastating blizzard called the group to perish. They did realise the problem with this theory though, as it didn't account for why the women and the children went missing too, as traditionally, the males go out to hunt. There were also rumours abound of a 10 year old boy wandering into a nearby Eskimo camp and essentially being adopted by them, but never spoke a word. It was theorised that he may have come from the village, but there was no clear evidence of that. That is the end of this incident, and at this stage, I feel it's important to question the sincerity of the article. A necessary point to make here, firstly, is that this incident was picked up by a lot of news outlets at the time, which could indicate a sense of seriousness and genuineness. However, I would point out that the Canadian authorities later stated that the case was not real. They state, the story about the disappearance in the 1930s of an Inuit village near Lake Anjikuni is not true. An American author by the name of Frank Edwards is purported to have started this story in his book, Stranger Than Science. It has become a popular piece of journalism, repeatedly published and referred to in books and magazines. There is no evidence, however, to support such a story. A village with such a large population would not have existed in such a remote area of the Northwest Territories. Furthermore, the mounted police who patrolled the area recorded no untoward events of any kind, and neither did local trappers or missionaries. However, I will note that the claim of origin cannot possibly be true, as Frank Edwards book was published in 1959, and throughout this video I have been referring to articles published in the 1930s. Perhaps the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were suggesting that the story didn't originate in the book, but was perhaps popularised by the book. Although that is quite odd, and if they meant that, then I'm sure that's how it would have been phrased. Now as said, during the early 1930s, many newspapers picked this story up, but it's interesting to note that the author's name was listed at the top of the article each time, with a copyright notice. What's relevant here is that the author, Emmett E. Keller, was the only person to publish the article, and so the incident was essentially copy-pasted exactly the same in all of the newspapers credited to Emmett. Meaning, I presume, that each newspaper paid Emmett to use the story in their individual papers. I will note that the copyright notice is odd, because you literally cannot copyright factual information, factual incidents, events, history, etc. under any circumstances, period. This is true for every country on earth, as far as I'm aware, and for obvious reasons too. Because if this wasn't the case, then in theory, whoever wrote about a historical event first, such as the Second World War, or even a singular incident such as a crime, or a disappearance, could claim to own all the rights to it. Which obviously does not make sense, and isn't the case in any country that I'm aware of. This is important here, because that could indicate that the incident is purely a fictional writing, and therefore copyrighted to the author. It's also worth pointing out that plagiarism and copyright are not the same thing, although there is an obvious overlap. Now while you can't copyright factual information, you can be plagiarised if the person writing about the same incident as you has copied your writings word for word. However, the moment the work is paraphrased, changed, quoted, and cited correctly, plagiarism has not happened. And not only that, but it is notoriously difficult to prove, especially when it comes to factual information, because factual information lies in the public domain, and as the name might suggest, is public information available to all. And all of that is before you even consider the concept of fair use. I felt that this was important to distinguish here to avoid any confusion, because this is a topic with a lot of misinformation, and many people don't seem to be aware of this in regards to factual information. I will note here though, that that information might not be completely relevant here, because copyright understanding has developed over the years, and even in the early 2000s, companies were paying for licenses to talk about factual events, which of course is no longer the case. Though, that could demonstrate that Emmett simply felt that he had the rights to the incident, and the newspapers didn't want to deal with the hassle. 
At this stage, I did a bit of further digging to see if I could find any evidence of a police investigation at the time. While no hard evidence was presented to me, I did find a number of newspapers that covered the incidents many years after the fact. All of which had no connection with the author, Emma T. Keller. These articles made the following statements. Towards the end of 1931, Mounted police have taken up the hunt and trappers have been asked to be on the lookout, but nothing so far has been learned. In 1964, Years of investigation have failed to provide a single clue as to the fate of any member of the vanishing village of Anjikuni. The Mounties filed it as unsolved and so it remains. Finally, in 1967, the Williamsport Sunday Grit National Edition reported, Joe travelled 500 miles to the nearest mounted police base at Churchill to tell his story. The Mounties returned with him to the deserted village and confirmed his findings. About 30 people had simply vanished without taking even the necessities of life. The Mounties thoroughly investigated the disappearance and finding nothing, they finally filed the mystery. More than 35 years later, it remains an unsolved mystery. After this, I can find no further mention of Joe LaBelle or the incident. Skeptoid.com related something interesting. On the 17th of January, 1931, Cortland Stance, the Commissioner of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, released an investigation of the events undertaken by a Sergeant J. Nelson. Nelson, in speaking with local traders, learned that Joe LaBelle was a real person and worked in northern Manitoba. Nobody in the region had heard of this village or its disappearance. Nelson concluded that the story was not real. However, and for balance, it's worthy to note that it's not completely clear if Sergeant Nelson's investigation was sanctioned by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. But he would later declare, I could find no foundations for this story. According to MysteriousUniverse.org, in the November 1976 edition of Fate magazine, this mystery was dusted off in an article titled, Vanish Village Revisited by Dwight Wayland. The article confirmed that there were records showing that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police had investigated the case again in 1931. These Mounties stated that they discovered an uninhabited settlement, but they deemed it to be either a seasonal or permanent abandonment of the site with no mysterious overtones and closed the case. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the fate article for myself, but many outlets have stated the same information and that Dwight had definitely included a Royal Canadian Mounted Police report. I have also seen the argument posed that the Inuit tribes at the time were still somewhat nomadic, and therefore it would be highly unlikely that they would have deserted their homes like that, especially if they left behind all of their belongings. It seems to me that this case has long since gone cold and it's unlikely that any further information is going to arise, so I'm going to hand this one over to you. What do you make of this incident? Do you think that there is some sincerity to it or was it completely made up? Given that we can be fairly certain that Joel LaBelle existed, does that add credibility or did he tell Emmett his story who then proceeded to embellish it either a little or a lot? As always, I'm looking forward to seeing the conversation and I do read all the comments, so do share your thoughts. Thank you for watching. If you found the video interesting, then please do leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already, it helps me a lot. If not, then feel free to leave a dislike, I'm just looking for your honest opinion, so do share your thoughts. And do share your opinion on whether you think it was real or fake. As always, I'm looking forward to seeing the conversation. I'd also just like to say a special thank you to my patrons who keep this channel moving forwards, so thank you very much for your support. I hope that you've had a great day or evening depending on where you are. Be safe guys and I'll see you next time. Peace.